Hello, my name is Hannah Kent and I am the author of Burial Rats and the Good People and today I'm going to be answering some of your frequently asked questions about burial rats, my first novel. Are the ravens of burial rites? I thought I was being really tricky when I was putting them in. Um, I thought that no one would really pick up on the fact that they're mentioned so frequently, but of course, readers are very smart. And many of you have asked me about the ravens in the book. Um, the ravens are in burial rites for quite a few reasons. Um, probably the most obvious one is that there are ravens in Iceland, and they would have been a familiar sort of bird to people like Agnes and Toti and the characters in the novel. Um, this is especially so because you tend to see a lot of ravens in Iceland in the winter time, whereas a lot of other birds migrate. And they become, from my experience in living in the country, quite, quite a beautiful and, and frequent sight. You know, the snowy fields and the snowy fjords and then these dark birds circling above them. And it's incredibly beautiful. So on one hand, I wanted to include the ravens simply because they're there and it's, um, it's a lovely image and it's something I wanted to distill into the book in prose. The other reasons um, are a little bit more, they have a little bit more of, you know, they have symbolic meaning basically. Um, ravens are quite present in a lot of Norse and Germanic mythology and history. For instance, the Norse god Odin had two ravens that were said to sit on each shoulder and they were called Hugen and Munin, which mean thought and memory respectively. And they, um, they did his bidding in, in many different ways. And, um, they were therefore, you know, sort of familiar sim symbols and familiar birds in terms of that sort of mythology. Um, and I wanted to keep that. I like the idea of ravens being considered, as they often are, in, in many different cultures as being, as being wise birds. But ravens also um, have a lot of symbolic import, largely because of their colour, the fact they feed on carrion, um, as being birds of ill omen. And given the tragic nature of burial rites, I thought they could speak to that too. Um, they often can sort of considered as a, as a creature um, that mediates between life and death and um, obviously that has influence. I also, um, sort of from a personal perspective, when I was writing the book I kept noticing crows and ravens. They just seemed to really, I don't know, spring out at me um, when I was going for walks or when I was in Iceland, absolutely. I noticed them everywhere and they seemed to have creative significance for me. So I wanted to include them um, and I wanted to align them with Agnes particularly and I think it, in some ways um, her fondness for them or her consideration of them reflects her own awareness that people see her as, as an ill omen, that people see her as um, unkind uh, and there's this line of course in the book where she says you know things must be, I'm going to par paraphrase myself and butcher the saying without the book in front of me, but she says something along the lines of, you know, if creatures cannot be loved for their kindness, they should be loved for their wisdom. And I think she's saying that of ravens, but of course she's also saying that for herself. So the stones, I'm guessing from your question, are specifically the stones that Agnes refers to as, um, the, the stone really, that Agnes refers to as being the one her mother gave her on her departure when she sort of abandoned Agnes and left her with a foster family. Um, and Agnes refers back to this stone. I, 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 um, in my research I came across this sort of, a lot of really interesting folklore and something that I came across were that they were, there were these particular stones and if you, um, put them under your tongue, um, you would be able to speak to the animals. And there were certain ways that you could create these stones or bestow this sort of power on stones. And um, when I was writing Burial Rats, I was really, I was thinking a lot about language, um, you know, especially people who are allowed access to language and people who are not. And I really saw Agnes as someone who was silenced in many ways during her lifetime, but also especially in the final great silencing, you know, being her, um, beheading. I, um, I wanted to include this because in some ways, you know, there are so many stones in Iceland. It, it's, it's a cheap gift. It's also not really a useful gift. It's something that Agnes's mother, she has nothing and she gives Agnes something which is symbolic of her, her you know, her poverty, I suppose. Um, and yet this becomes something that Agnes clings to. It becomes symbolic of the possibility of another language, another means of communication, another means of expressing herself and telling her story. Um, I also, of course, you know, 
even the act of putting a stone in your mouth is an act of silencing yourself. You imagine your tongue being weighted down by stone. I thought that had particular significance in regards to Agnes's story. And so I included it for that reason too. Um, I also just think it sounded poetic. It was the ideas, much like raven stones or something, I kept on coming back to as these images that would occur to me as I was writing. And I wanted to, in to include that. I know there's, um, Agnes refers to stones later on in the novel as well. Um, as you know, the final events draw nearer, and it's the same idea of having of, of weight and of um, silence, and I guess of oppression too. You know, this idea that you have nothing, that you have stones. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that exactly makes sense. It's one of those weird things where I think, you know, as you're writing a book, it's not like you necessarily think of symbols and you try to put them in at every available opportunity. Sometimes it's a sort of a you know, semi-unconscious process. You end up putting things in there, images and words and, and bits and pieces that you've picked up in your research or in your reading, and it's only really later that you're forced to interrogate why you put them there. So that's probably the closest approximation that I can reach. I'm not sure. Um, I think that's a very good reading of it and entirely possible, but I don't have any firm opinion on that. Um, this, he mentions the, that the previous mural was an image of Jacob wrestling with the angel. Um, I think that sort of speaks for itself really. Isn't that what Toti is doing throughout the novel, but also Agnes wrestling with the angel, um, wrestling with your good and bad sides? Um, I might talk a little bit about landscape and weather in my answer to this question. It was incredibly important for me to include the Icelandic landscape in this book as, you know, with, and give it as enough, um, enough presence and significance as I would a character. I consider it a character in this novel. And the reasons for that sort of um, are many, really. Um, the first one is that when you're writing historical fiction, it, I think it's really important to include the landscape and to include the weather for the simple reason that people lived in much closer proximity to it and we're affected much more by it than we are in our contemporary age, you know. I might be sitting outside now, but you can be assured that if it was, you know, pouring down and freezing cold or snowing, I'd be inside where there was artificial light, artificial heat. Um, I think we, in our modern age, experience a real dislocation from the elements that people in the historic past didn't necessarily have the option of. So, and this is particularly true in Iceland, and to some degree even true today the weather would really shape your days. And this is why I include sections in the novel where even the district commissioner is saying, you know, if the auction can't be held because of bad weather, it'll be the next day. They, people had to constantly make allowances for bad weather. And bad weather in Iceland is really bad weather. It means, you know, you're housebound, basically. Um, I was there recently and there was a blizzard and we had all these plans, but you're not going out in a blizzard, you can't do anything. So on one hand, the inclusion of landscape in burial rites is um, part and parcel of me trying to accurately represent the world as it was back then. So you need to include the snow and the wind and the days where people are housebound. You need to make sure that the reader understands that um, the weather would have an impact on people's moods if they couldn't get out, that in many ways their characters would be shaped by the landscape and the weather that they live in. I think that's my personal observation. Many might disagree with me, but I think you, st so you see this even in people's, um, in people's characters in Iceland. I think there's a certain practicality there and a certain stoicism. And I think a lot of that comes with having to deal with essentially quite a hostile environment at times. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is um, I had to have that transition from summer to winter because that was the timeline that these events occurred on. In, in, I was, I, in writing this book, I spent a lot of time researching these events and I told myself that I had to stay true to what was known and established. And the dates of Agnes's transition or move to Cornsall and then also the date of her execution, I couldn't change. But why would I? Because as a novelist you're also looking to create atmosphere and having the summer months, you know, for a shorter and the onset of autumn and then the threat of winter coming is incredibly powerful. And I suppose you're trying to explore the particular, like I said, atmosphere um, and mood that comes from the descent into winter. It suited the subject matter. Um, 
So that's sort of on two hands. Another little point I probably make is um, is that when I lived in Iceland, I completely fell in love with the landscape. It was the first thing I really connected with before I learned the language or before I sort of really made friends over there. Um, I found it incredibly beautiful. Sometimes it was incredibly hostile, but there was beauty in that hostility. And a big part of the reason why I first, way years and years ago, I first set out to write this book, book was because I was homesick for Iceland. And writing about the landscape was one way that I could place myself back there. So I guess like with anything in a book, there's, you know, things that are, the ways in which I've used the landscape to create atmosphere or to um, make reflections on character and to, you know, portray the time as it was. But on the other hand, it was also because I missed it and I found it beautiful and I wanted to see if I could capture that beauty in prose on the page. Um, lots of people have asked me if I, if I wrote this book um, t as a feminist novel or if I um, was trying to make any sort of feminist commentary um, through, through it. Um, the answer is, of course, I'm interested in, in gender roles, and they were significant back in Iceland at the time, um, although not as significant as you might imagine. For instance, um, women could read and write, and that was something that many people could not do across Europe and Scandinavia at that time. Um, literacy was really widespread. Um, and so they were all you know, well-educated, these, these, um, these women. Um, also, women could hold property and they could divorce their husbands. And again, rights which have not always been afforded women everywhere, um, particularly throughout the 19th century. Um, however, what I wanted to sort of explore more than just gender and the differences in, in the roles and expectations of society at that time. I wanted to explore, I guess, the moments when gender intersected with poverty, especially in the case of women. Um, but also to a certain degree in the case of men. And this is where you start to see, I guess, some um, class differences in Iceland. Um, women, uh, well, people who were poor, people who did not own property, had fewer rights than people who did. Um, this was especially true if you were a landless servant, as Agnes is, but also as her brother would become, and there are many other characters as well mentioned who would be landless servants. Basically, from a young age, you would go to a farm um, and you would sign on and you would you would work there in return for a board and a, um, accommodation you know board and accommodation and also you would be paid in butter um, you'd very rarely see cash or money in your life um, you would not be permitted to change your place of employment um, there were there were certain days which is sort of loosely translated to flitting days which I believe occurred around sort of February or March and it was only at that time that you were allowed to sort of go elsewhere to work so if you were stuck somewhere um, where you didn't like the family or you they were abusive towards you there was very little that you could do um, especially in a country like Iceland where during the winter months you, you cannot live outside there's nowhere else for you to go there's no sort of system set up to support people who were especially vulnerable um, and I think you see this in the book in in regards to Agnes's mother she is a woman who um, falls pregnant to the farmers that she works for there's various debate about whether or not that was consensual or not. Um, certainly there were cases where the children, illegitimate were children out of you know, consensual relationships with the, with the farmers or the heads of certain households and their servants. And also the opposite is true as well. Basically, I think Agnes's mother is a good example because she finds herself in a position where she has two illegitimate children. She doesn't own any land, she's not married, she doesn't have a support system, which back then would have translated to basically having family who might be able to put you up or support you or put in a good word for you. And if you were a farmer looking to hire servant women, you'd much rather hire people who didn't have children because these are two extra mouths to feed. So you do find yourself, as Agnes's mother did, in, in an incredibly vulnerable position. And you're forced to probably make choices like, do, do I leave my children to be raised by somewhere else, knowing that they're also going to be brought up as, as landless servants? Um, a few other things. I believe at the time that you were not permitted to be married unless you owned land or that you rented land, um, which limited, I guess, again, the options for people to have families um, and to create their own support system. If you did have family throughout the district and or a lot of siblings or if you, you, know, you weren't illegitimate, you had more options because you had more people to turn to. 
Um, but if you are, you know, isolated, as Agnes is, you don't really have a choice. You're basically forced to work for your living and you don't always get a say about, you know, where you're going to do that and the, and the conditions of your life. So it's really then that you start to see um, the disempowerment that did exist, particularly amongst women. And I say that largely because they could bear children and they were made more vulnerable to the children that they had. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, gender is important, um, but if you consider the difference, for instance, between a woman like Margaret, who essentially runs that farm and that family, um, she has quite a lot of power, she has quite a lot of say and influence in her community, and compare that with someone like Agnes's mother or Agnes herself, you start to see the difference. You know? So gender is important, but gender plus poverty or plus certain social conditions is even more relevant. And that's what I wanted to explore. So yeah, not, not just a feminist cause, also exploring classist issues. Um, the only character left out of the Cornsell family was a brother. He was included in early drafts, but it, um, he basically did, he did very little, and there were so many names anyway. Uh, I, he wasn't performing any function, and I thought it was much more interesting to cut him out so as to focus on the relationships between the two sisters. Um, also, he was older, and it was likely that he might not have even been home. He might have been out working, or he might have been travelling. Um, but I felt compelled to include Pieter because this is a case that's still very well known in Iceland, and the omission of Pieter would have been, um, would have caused, uh, you know, that's much more noticeable than the omission of a brother that no one would have really been aware of. Also, I think it's, I think it's interesting to, in, I think it's interesting to include Pieter. I think there's significance in the fact that he was also killed, and it raises a lot of questions because undoubtedly Natan was the target of the murders, whether they were premeditated or sort of a crime of passion, and the fact that Pieta was also killed, I think, you know, creates some interesting questions. I, um, I, I liked him as a character, I wanted to write him. He was also someone who was famous for having dreams, and he also, also the fact that he was sort of awaiting sentencing on previous crimes, but allowed to walk free, speaks to sort of the way that the Icelandic justice system was run back then. So, yeah, no, I never considered omitting him. I thought he was quite crucial to the story. I um, had no idea who that man was, and it's been amazing with people um, people getting back to me with certain ideas. Yeah, let's make it Joas. Some people have said, is it Snibjorn? Um, you know, Rosalind's husband. Sure, let's make it Snibjorn. I, I don't mind. I think it's um, I think it's wonderful that people see that moment, which is significant, but it's especially significant. I, I didn't have someone in mind, but I love those. I love those ideas. I think it's, um, I didn't really set out especially to make a statement about either fragility or strength of women. Um, my real aims in portraying women in this book, particularly Agnes, was simply to sort of override um, sort of the dichotomous representation of women as either good or bad. Um, you know, you're either the angel of the house or you're a devil. I, um, when I was researching the book, I kept on coming across representations of Agnes, where she was basically described as a witch. She was described as this evildoer um, when they wondered why she had been, you know, they believed her guilty, of course, but when they said, oh, you know, why did she do it? It sort of came down to the fact that she was just a bad person. And that didn't sit well with me. I, um, I don't really subscribe to the idea that people are either good or bad. I think people aren't really either. I think we do good or bad things, um, but that our actions are always to a certain degree um, shaped or they arise out of circumstances which are not always you know within our control you know so sometimes we do things or we feel we have certain choices because of um, a wider cultural or social context um, political context things like this we're all of us shaped by the times in which we live and a big part of my trying to portray Agnes was to show that she was a lot of the choices that she felt were available to her um, were not because she was inherently good or bad, but because she was a product of her time and her life was, um, you know. So a lot of in my portrayal of Agnes was not to um, was not to sort of portray her as, as good or bad or to protest or attest to her guilty conviction. It was um, rather trying to show that um, 
she did the things she did because she felt that those were the options available to her and the reason she thought that they were the only things available to her was because of the, the wider circumstances of her life and her birth and her gender and her class. Um, so, you know, and inevitably I think when you're trying to portray characters, and this is true for both men and women, as, you know, multifaceted human beings, as complex and contradictory as we all are, it's inevitable that you're going to explore things like strength. It's inevitable that you're, at the same time, you're also going to be examining their fragility. So rather than it being a specific sort of, um, rather than it being specifically something that I wanted to explore in relation to women, I think it's probably, it was probably just an inevitable part of trying to um, create complex, ambiguous, very human characters. You know, we are all of us strong. We all have moments of strength and we also have moments of vulnerability and fragility. That's just the nature of being human. I, I don't, I didn't intend to write a sympathetic portrayal, more an empathetic portrayal. And there is a difference between the two. Um, and I think the reason for that is um, because I, I think from a position of empathy you can encourage a more ambiguous representation. Keep in mind when I was writing this book, I was writing against previous representations where Agnes was absolutely described as monstrous um, and was only ever really considered in that light or that in one other representation in a 1990 film also titled Agnes, an Icelandic film, she is made into, you know, she's the opposite. She becomes an angel and faultless. She um, she's made into a mother, for instance, to make her much more sympathetic. And I didn't really want to go with either. So when I say ambiguous, I wanted to land somewhere in the middle. Um, obviously, her situation is sympathetic. I think everyone would feel sorry for someone who's sentenced to death. You can't escape that. But in trying to approach her story from a, a position of empathy or using empathy to write her story, what I was trying to do instead was to look at those um, the cultural circumstances of her life, the social circumstances, to try and show that she's, um, you know, there was more to her ending up in this situation than, you know, just an inherent unequivocal evil. Um, I, I also did a few things, perhaps unsuccessfully, I don't know, um, to encourage reader doubt in Agnes and to sort of suggest that, you know, she is still quite a manipulative character. She is unreliable. Um, a lot of the book is her, is the, in third person, is her telling her story to other people and then she's telling the story to people that she believes could help her out of the situation that she's in. So for instance Toti but also the family. She wants to them to regard her in a particular light so naturally she's shaping the story to encourage sympathy from them. However you also have those sections in first person where she's actively thinking you know what, did, what, am, what am I going to tell the reverend. She's sort of um, having a real good think and reflection on on exactly how she's going to represent herself and her story. And I, I especially wanted that in the book to suggest that we might not be able to trust everything that she says, um, particularly in those last sections where she's describing the night of the murders to Margaret. You know. is, she tell, is she including every bit of information or is she being selective? Um, I think a lot of readers like to take what she says at face value, but certainly when I was writing the book, I wanted to have that, that doubt seeded in there. Um, it's not that, again, that I'm suggesting that she's lying outright, but I think she ensures, given the opportunity to finally tell her side of the story, none of us consider ourselves evil, and we all retell particular stories that we're involved in to flatter ourselves, and I think she's guilty of doing that. Um, in terms of her motivations of killing Nathan, if, if this happened in a modern-day context, there's no doubt that she would be held even partially responsible. Which I'm, cer I'm certain that she'd still receive a similar sentence. She lied to the court, that's been documented. She, um, she did not reveal all information. It was only through the discrepancies and the testimonies between hers and, and Sigurds that they was realised that the maids had been involved because their stories didn't add up. Um, and she certainly had a lot against Natan, which makes her motive suspicious. So, but I was never really writing this book to sort of say, you know, is it a who done it? Who really killed Natan? It's a why done it. It was, um, you know, I wrote the book to examine, I suppose, her potentially conflicting motivations, and also the wider circumstances of um, of how she got there.
poems um, that are included in the novel, attributed to poet Rosa and Agnes, are actually um, actually real. The one that's the, an exchange between them, where poet Rosa writes to Agnes saying, you know, you have broken my heart, essentially, and the reply is very much believed to be um, written by Agnes um, and is the only sort of series of poems that I could found, find between the women. Um, back in Iceland, in this time, people... It was something that I just I loved reading about in my research, but basically you could fight with people, you could argue th with people through poetry. You would compose a poem and you would spread it around and it would get back to the person. You know, it might, it's basically a nasty limerick um, about that person and they would hear and they'd probably be offended and so if they wanted to engage in the argument or rebut whatever you had said, they would come up with sort of a nasty poem about you. Um, poet Rosa is a very famous figure in Iceland to this day, people still study her poetry in schools, um, whereas the poems of Agnes are, are not well known. In fact, I think this is the only poem, the one included, that I, I knew was, from, was written by her. I wish I could have found more. Um, there are some, but it's impossible to verify that it was her. Um, but she was still regarded as a poet in her community, particularly in her earlier years. And this was, you know, this was nothing, nothing small. It was quite an honour to be regarded as a poet. Icelanders back then put incredible importance and significance on, on literacy and, and on poetry. And it, um, even though these people had very little, many of them, um, poetry and, and source stories and legends and the ability to recite, the ability to compose, you know, that was, that was a big part of their cultural identity. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, the poem that is in there between Agnes and poet Rosa is real. Um, the translation is mine, like with any translation of any poem, there's a literal translation, then you hope to try and provide an accurate uh, translation of the meaning, the deeper meaning or symbolic meaning as possible, and I hope I've done that. But yeah, in, um, most of the, you can actually go online and find lots of poems that were written by, um, by Rosa, poet Rosa. I think even Björk um, sings one of them, there's a track of her singing one of the poems, so yeah, but yeah, they're real. I think that's a very good question, and perhaps not one that I'm really able to answer. Drawing sort of um, Natan in the novel was in some ways quite a challenge because we only ever see Natan through Agnes's eyes, and we only really ever get, ever get her memories of him, but coming from a time where she is at once both grieving for him, but also, you know, um, she's been betrayed by him, or she sees that she's been betrayed by him. And she's also being accused of his murder. So it's a troubling place for her to really be in and to be looking back upon those memories. It's coloured, I guess, the, those memories are, 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 are seen through a lens of her current situation, which, you know, makes them difficult. Is she remembering what she remembers because she feels sad about what happens, because she misses him? Is she remem those memories are occurring to her because they have particular significance um, because she is where she is right now? She said there are many times where she thinks back on her times with Natan because she has no friends and she has no one that she's connecting to. Maybe she misses that. But also she is incredibly angry, so she's thinking back to things. She's reflecting on that anger and she's reflecting on her grief. Um, so it's very difficult to sort of ever have, a, I guess, a, a true portrayal of what their relationship would have been like. Everything is comes from Agnes' own prejudices and, and and feelings. She, maybe she thought that he did and then she believes that he didn't in the end. Maybe um, she considers that ultimately he was using her or manipulating her. I think probably all of those various readings are true. Um, but did he ever love her? You know, Agnes's views aside, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I would like to think so. Maybe not. No, I don't think so. I don't. Um, I don't read the book. I haven't really read Barry White since it's been published, um, and I'm sure if I did, I'd probably find things that I wanted to change because I think you're forever tinkering. But but no.
<laughs> no, I don't think I'd change anything. Thank you all so much for your questions and for getting in touch. I hope you found the answers that you were looking for. If you do have any more questions, feel free to hop on my website. Um, it's hannahkentauthor.com. There's all sorts of information for both burial rights and the good people up on there, as well as some biographical information and any events that I might be doing if you want to come along and hear me speak. Also, if you want a more immediate answer, I'm on Instagram. You can find me at Hannah Kent Writes.